Jesus. a miracle working God. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in his presence. If our ushers could come, receive the morning tithe and offering this morning. I'm going to ask you to be in prayer for our conference that starts tomorrow in Danley, Honduras. The 16 from Nicaragua are on their way. They're not far from the border, about to cross over into Honduras and then El Salvador. They're coming today, crossing over and uh, Brother Stephen, Brother B.J. Larson are flying this morning to Honduras, and Brother Jose and Brother Kyle Taylor are there right now, along with Brother Victor. So be in prayer this week for a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God, that he would do a great work in Honduras this week. Also, this week, starting tonight, we start our revival. Please don't miss one service of this revival. Monday night, 7 o'clock, Tuesday and Wednesday, 7 p.m., Invite somebody to the house of God. We have seen people throughout the years just just give an invitation to somebody to come. Come with me in revival on a Monday or Tuesday night, and you never know. Somebody come in this house, get saved, get delivered, get filled with the Holy Ghost, get healed in their body. Testimony after testimony has come forth from the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Monday night or tonight and Monday, Brother David Wilson and then Brother Andy Stringfellow, Tuesday and Wednesday. You don't want to miss this. Also, this morning, after our morning service, we're having our Thanksgiving meal. Everyone is invited to stay with us. We want you to be with us this morning right across the way in the gymnasium. Also, our midweek service every year in th- during the Thanksgiving time is changed to Tuesday instead of Wednesday. So, The date on that will be Tuesday, November the 22nd. Service time will be at 7 o'clock as usual. We do this for for those of you that are traveling and those of you that are cooking for for people coming out of your family, coming from out of town. Then the Christmas play will be, uh, we've been practicing every Wednesday night, all the young people. We, We have to have your child here on Wednesday night, every Wednesday night for play practice if they want to be a part of the Christmas program. Christmas program is December the 11th on a Sunday night at 6 p.m. Praise the Lord. Brother Glenn, would you come and play a song? Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm singing today. Oh, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Yes, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Oh, trouble and sorrow. I've had a show with it.
Yeah. 
Amen. I like that. That's how we're going to make it. Because everything's going to get real confusing in this end time. You're not going to understand a lot of things. There are going to be people that once served God. They're going to turn away from God. The Bible speaks of this whenever it talks about the great apostasy. To be an apostate means to know the ways of God and to turn from it. It's going to happen. It's happening. When this takes place, just stand on His Word. Hold on to God. Amen. It's so good to have our school of ministry back with us. They traveled to eight states, 19 services, and they look like they're raring to go this morning, don't they? Amen. It's so good to have them. This time we're going to dismiss all of our children at Children's Church, age 5 to 12. Again, stay with us. Everyone stay with us after the service this morning for our Thanksgiving meal. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 11. I am very excited about revival service. I believe God's talked to these evangelists. They've prayed, sought the Lord. They're ready to go. And I know God's going to help us this week. He's going to revive our souls. He's going to speak specifically to us. And that's the beauty of revivals. God moves in a special way. He said it the last several services that the evangelist is a gift to the church. It's, the, it's a gift to the body of Christ. And um, you don't want to miss these revival services. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, at least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we already feel in this sanctuary this morning. We ask you, Lord, that you would let this word become alive to us. Lord, I'm asking you to prick and penetrate our hearts. Speak specifically to our individual needs. And Lord, I'm asking you as a church body that you'd speak collectively to us. Help us, Holy Ghost, to be aware, not be ignorant to the enemy's devices. Lord, I'm asking you to illuminate our minds and our spirits, change us and transform us by the power of the sweet Holy Ghost of God. We ask you in Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. I'm going to preach to you this morning on, Don't open the door of disobedience. Don't open the door of disobedience. Many in the church today do not realize that they are putting their very life in danger. Not only their own life, but the life of their family. They are opening the door to the enemy of their soul. Just for a moment, I want you to imagine you're living in a neighborhood. And that neighborhood is filled with violence and crime. There's not one day that passes by that there is not chilling news of murder, rape, and abduction. And you find out that there is somebody stalking your home. You don't know what's going to happen. You're, you're on the guard constantly. You don't know what they want. They may want to take your loved ones hostage, maybe plunder your home, destroy your possessions, maim the ones you love, perhaps even kill you. And you're, there's no begging or pleading or crying that would change your enemy's mind. I want you to think about it today. You say, well, I move out of that neighborhood. Well, you didn't have time to move out of the neighborhood. In light of all of this, let me ask you, would you lock your door that night when you went to bed? Even a crazier question that I could ask, would you leave the front door of your 
house open. I can tell you there's not an answer in this house that would be, yeah, Brother Matt, I'd leave my front door unlocked or open. But I can tell you we're doing it every single day of our lives. We are giving Satan access to our personal life, the life of our family, our home, when we walk in the spirit of of disobedience. Listen, all throughout the Word of God, you will find that disobedience brings the curse, but obedience brings the blessing. I'm here this morning to tell you on the onset of this message, listen to the Word of God. Stand on His Word as they sung just a moment ago. Listen, hell is coming against you and I on every front. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Don't get your mind changed when it comes to what God tells us to do and what He tells us to stand on because truth and righteousness will always win in the end. There is a danger when we leave the door open to our soul. I see it all the time. How do we leave the door open to our soul? It's nothing new. It's not exclusive to this generation. The door has been open. It's as ancient, this This system, this method the enemy has of moving in to our life is as ancient as the devil himself. It's the iniquity, this sin. It caused the fall of the morning star, Lucifer, and displaced a third of the angels of heaven. What is the sin against the holy God that puts us in grave danger? It is rebellion. It is disobedience against God's authority. I am amazed today at how so many people are ignorant to what the Word of God says. Listen, you and I are not going to get a pass because we didn't know what God said in His Word. We have His holy book before us. You have preaching. You have teaching. You have access to the Word of God. Hear me today. We must grab a hold of the Word of God. Meditate. Read it. Meditate. Let it be written on the tables of our heart. Don't let it anything hinder the truth of God's word in your life. The rebellion and disobedience from Satan many years ago, it caused a third of the angels to fall with him. It is rebellion and disobedience against God's authority. You may say this morning, well, praise God, I didn't know what this great thing was that was a danger before you mentioned rebellion and disobedience. Brother Matt, I'm not in rebellion. I'm loving Jesus. I'm praising Him every day. I'm I'm trying to keep all the commandments of God. Well, praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to say this to you. None of us are willfully going to enter in to disobedience. It's always deception by disobedience. Now, there are those out there who will completely transgress the will of God. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's the deception that we can enter into disobedience. Deception that will pull us in and we don't even know what we're disobeying God in. It's dangerous to not know God's truth. Satan and his cohorts are very cunning and crafty. He's been doing this for thousands of years. He knows mankind. He knows the weaknesses of man. He knows the strategy, how to lie, how to lay down the traps and the tricks uh, to entangle you and I about. So what we must do, we must be sober. We must be vigilant. uh, For our adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour. Somebody in this house needs to wake up uh, and we need to realize the enemy's trying to destroy us and trying to get on the inside. He's trying to enter into our home. I'm here this morning to warn you, don't open the door of disobedience. The enemy will come in and he'll destroy everything in that house, everything in that life. We must understand this. Most believers do not dive willfully in disobedience. Rather, They fall into it by the way of deception. Is this really possible? How can I be deceived, Brother Matt? We know the truth. Well, Jesus makes it clear in Matthew 24 and 24. He refers to the very end times and he says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they would 
deceive the very elect. You say, well, Brother Matt, I, there's no way that I would believe that. Let me just say this. There is a spirit of deception that's moving across this land today. It's a spirit that is changing the hearts and lives of men. It is possible for you to know the Word of God, for you to cut your teeth on the back of a church pew and still be deceived in the last day. You cannot get away from the Word of God. I'm going to preach it until there's no more preach left in me, until there's no more love of breath in my nostrils, you got to hold on to God's truth because there is deception all around us today. If it were possible, Jesus said, even the very elect would be deceived. Let's look at our text this morning. It was Paul the apostle. He says, God speaking, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, at least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through subtly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul, the apostle, compared the believer's vulnerability to deception with the deception Eve succumbed to in the Garden of Eden. Think about it today. Eve had a good life. She did not have a bad home life. She wasn't raised because she didn't have. A, she was the first creation. Her and Adam. So they didn't have a bad, they didn't have anything to compare. There's a lot of people out there that will blame their past on what they're walking in today. They'll blame their disobedience or, or they'll blame things that, that, that they haven't gotten victory over because of something in their past. Let me tell you something. Uh, I understand that your past can shape you, but because of the cross of Calvary, every single stronghold can be broken. You don't have to be a victim of your past. There is victory in the name of Jesus. I can tell you about my past. I've had a bad past because of sin. But thanks be unto God, there's still power in the cross of Calvary. And that blood breaks every stronghold of the adversary. Paul compares that vulnerability there. He says, be careful. Remember, Adam was not deceived. It was Eve that was deceived. Adam completely and totally, willfully sinned against God. The, the serpent in the garden, he deceived Eve. He tricked her. But Adam walked on the scene and she had that forbidden fruit in her hand. And he partook of that fruit knowing exactly what he did. There are people out there who will sin with their eyes wide open. They don't believe that they'll ever come under the judgment of God. Let me just say this. My Bible still says when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Can I get a witness in this house? Uh, listen to me. Uh, it wasn't Adam that was deceived, but it was Eve who came under this spell of deception. She came under this lie of the enemy. Listen to me today. We see that the majority of people who are deceived, the majority know a lot of the Word of God. The devil knows the Word too. Don't think for one moment that he can't quote the Word of God, that he doesn't quote the Word of God because the devil knows the Word. Here we have to understand this, that, that, that she was deceived. Eve was deceived. Disobedience entered into her heart and it opened the door of the adversary. Did you hear me? Disobedience gives Satan access, legal access to your life. Listen to me. If I knew that somebody, some criminal, some murderer, some rapist, drug addict, had keys to my house, I believe I'd go get the locks changed. I believe I'd install cameras. I'd probably look for an excuse to buy another handgun. Come on, I don't have to have a whole lot of excuses to do that. But listen to me today, when we understand that he has access to your home. Can you imagine somebody that was a criminal, that was dangerous, having access to your life? I want to tell you, when we willfully disobey God's truth, God's law, we give him legal access access to our life. I'm here this morning. I'm going to make a, a, an appeal unto you. Don't you open that door of disobedience. Hold on to God's word. Hold on to his truth. And God will give you blessings you cannot contain. It's just like giving an enemy, a murderer, a key to your home. That's frightening to me. That is frightening to me. You know, we, we've had a lady clean our house, and, and she's a trustworthy lady. 
we feel we wouldn't let her in our house. This is several years ago. But I told my wife, I said, don't you ever give her a key to my house. Don't you ever, listen, there's only a few people who got a key to my house. My mom is one of them. You know, I just don't trust just anybody when it comes to my house. Listen, whenever you and I do not hold to God's word, I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you in the word of God this morning that you give Satan legal access to your life and you and I remove God's protective hand over our life, ladies and gentlemen, when we walk in disobedience. You can, I can prove it all throughout the word of God. God always protect the Israelites when they were walking close to him. When they were keeping his word. Whenever he was the center of their worship. But whenever Israel would begin to get away. When they would disobey God's word. God would remove his hand of protection and allow her enemies to afflict them. Don't make any mistake about it today. You can pray all the prayers you want to pray. You can make all the appeals that you want to make. If you want to be protected today, if you want to be secure in your home and in your life, be a keeper of God's word. Hold on to God's truth this morning. This morning I want to expose the enemy so we can once again come under God's divine protection. So how did the devil deceive Eve and gain access into her life? How was he so cunning and crafty to deceive Eve? First of all, he began to question the goodness of God. He began to question if God really loved them and how God really is. Let me tell you something. God is altogether lovely and He is good. There's no un, there's no wickedness in God. There's no weaknesses in God. There's no failures in God. He wanted to question, though, the goodness of God. If you'll remember to that second verse, chapter of the book of Genesis, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here it is. It's presented God's goodness unto Eve and Adam. Every tree you can eat. Well, that's a pretty good deal right there. I mean, everything in that garden is yours. You have access to everything. Listen, listen. God doesn't have a whole lot of... There's a lot more rules that we place on ourselves than God places on us. He does want us to keep His truth. He wants us to be separated from evil. But listen, God, He allows us to enjoy all the things of life. But there are certain things that God prohibits. Are you with me today? And here God has given them access to every tree. You can have everything in this garden, but there's only one tree. One tree that you're not to eat of. Everything in the garden is yours with one exception. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Listen, God did not create us to be robots. He did not create us and He wants us to have a free will. Listen, I, I, I'm glad that Sister Tori married me, but I'm more glad that she chose to marry me. Amen? You know, if I was in one of them situations where it was an arranged marriage, I probably still would have done the deal. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I can tell you, he, she chose to marry me. Uh, and you and I, whenever we come to God, we have to choose to come to Him. Uh, we choose to accept Him over this world. Uh, and we choose uh, to keep His commandments or to disobey. Are you with me today? Uh, so God, uh, He has given them her access and Adam access to everything in that garden uh, with one exception. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He created us with a free will. When he restricted their access to the tree, he provided a choice that protected them from death. Hear me today. Everything in life is a choice. In one side we have the choice, which is God's way, God's word, obedience to God. And the other side is our own way, our own will. One choice produces life, and the other choice produces death. Don't ever say the devil made me do anything, because the devil can't make you do anything. You are a free moral agent, thanks be unto God, and I have the power of grace. Grace helps me, it enforces my decision. What is the definition of grace? Grace is defined as God's ability to do what I cannot do in myself. You say, well, I'm not 
strong enough, preacher. You may not be in yourself, but whenever your free will makes up your mind to do the will of God and to keep his commandments, the grace of Almighty God, it joins with the free will of man. And I'm going to tell you, you can overcome. You can choose to do the right thing. Don't you tell me one time I keep overcoming or I keep being succumbed to temptation. No, my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able but will with the temptation Make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That means that every time that you're tempted, every time that you feel weak in your body, every time that you feel weak in your mind, all of a sudden if you'll make up your mind to get it back on the Word of God, to cast down those imaginations, the power of the Holy Ghost will come and give you strength to overcome. Not sometimes, but every time. My God is faithful and He will help you to overcome. Don't open that door of disobedience. Don't you dare open that door. Sin is crouching at that door constantly. That's what he told Cain. God spoke to Cain and said, sin is crouching at the door. What he was saying is you have an opportunity to get out of that. You have an opportunity to make the right choice. I'm here today preaching a very simple message to a good church today. Listen, sin is always a crouching at the door, just like a cat or a wild leopard just waiting to pounce on its prey. But listen, God has already spoke to us by His Spirit and He will show us the attack of the enemy before it ever comes our way. He told Cain, sin's crouching at the door and He tells us the same thing. Sin's always crouching at the door. Don't be ignorant to the devil's devices today. Let's examine the words of the serpent. He says in Genesis 3 and 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Look at this. The serpent ignored God's generosity and emphasized the exceptions, thus implying that God was trying to withhold something from Eve. He'll tell you that he don't want you. Satan will speak into your ear. He'll whisper in your ear and he'll say, God doesn't want you to be happy. God doesn't want you to enjoy some of the pleasures of this life. He, 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 does he, did he really say that? And he begins to question the goodness of God. And you'll wonder that thing. Listen, that seems like insane to even think that way. But I'm going to tell you that's exactly what the devil did to Eve. He said, did God really say that? And he, did he really say you're not to eat of this tree? He, he completely takes the point, the, the emphasis off all of the goodness of God, all the blessings of God, and he focuses on that one thing. He does the same thing with you and I. Listen, we don't want to ask, why don't we, why don't God want you to be happy? Satan will ask. He makes God out to be a taker instead of a giver, the giver that he is. Satan and Eve. Satan led Eve down a path of reasoning where she would eventually question God's goodness and integrity. I want you to think about it today. Listen, temptation comes on every front. We're constantly bombarded with temptation. And as you see this world beginning to get further and further away from Christ, those questions will come into your mind constantly. It's Satan questioning the goodness of God. Listen, Satan led Eve down that path of reasoning where she questioned God's goodness and integrity. Once Satan accomplished this and placed that seed of doubt in Eve's mind, She began to turn against God's authority. Though the woman corrected the servant, she said the seed, God allowed us to eat of every tree except for that tree. He said this, God knows when you do it, you'll be like him. And then he gives the lie that's been told for centuries and centuries. He asked the question, did God really say that? And then he says, you won't really die. That's the first time the unconditional eternal security message has ever been preached. Whenever he said, you won't 
really die. Listen to me. When sin is finished, it always brings forth death. Not sometimes, but every time. You will die. Oh, thanks be unto God for the power of the cross. We all have been, we've all sinned. But thank God that He has forgiven us. But I'm going to tell you, willful sin, walking in sin every day is a, is a, is a damnation to the soul, ladies and gentlemen. We must come out from among that sin. What does it mean to repent? It means to have a change of mind, a change of way to do a 180 degree turn and to walk away from that sin today. I'm here making an appeal to you. You must not open the door of disobedience. The devil wants to come into your life. He wants to come into that home and ultimately it will bring destruction. The first time unconditional eternal security was preached. What happened? She believed the lie of the devil. Ate the forbidden fruit and opened the door of disobedience. Listen, I'm preaching to eternal souls this morning. Eternal souls that are never going to die. And I'm warning you, don't open that door. Don't open that door. Don't question the goodness of God. His commands are placed there to protect you. After their disobedience, you know the story. They ate. Their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Their eyes were open. Everything changed about that individual. The Bible says that God had to drive that man and woman out of that garden because they were, it, they were sinful. They could no longer be in the presence of a holy God. Thanks be unto God, even before the foundation of the world, God knew they were going to do this, and there was a plan, and it's called the cross of Calvary. Listen to me today. Listen, if you have failed God miserably over and over again, God has a plan for you. It's called the cross. It's called the blood. Don't allow the adversary of your soul make you to believe that there is no more hope for you because he's the liar and the father of all lies. God can and will forgive. But you've got to come to the bleeding side of Calvary. There must be a true heart of repentance in your life. Through disobedience, it brought spiritual death. By usurping God's word and submitting to Satan, they opened the devil's door and he became their new master. They granted him not only access to their lives, but also entrance into the world. Satan's mode of operation differs very little today. He still desires to pervert God's character in order to turn us against his authority. He still operates the same way. Listen, the, my Bible says that the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But guess what? The devil's the same too. He, there's nothing new under the sun. He operates the same way. He still has the same techniques. And it's always questioning the goodness of God. Always uh, uh, trying to get you to ignore all the good things for a child of God. Listen, my, I, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life today. I have a peace that the world can't give and the world can't take away. I have access to the heavenly things, the rim of the supernatural. Listen, it is a good thing to be a child of God if I wasn't a child of God today I would be in complete total depression but what does he do he doesn't focus on those things he reminds you of the little things those little pleasures those things that the flesh wants he begins to question the goodness of God and he tells you that God's not good listen God is good God is altogether good and lovely and perfect in every way. James chapter 1 and 16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Give me some uh, house up here, brother. Harvest Time Church, it must be settled in your heart that there is nothing good outside of the rim of God's will. Nothing. You say, well, Brother Matt, it looks so beautiful. I know it looks beautiful, but it's not beautiful. It's deceiving. You say, well, the grass looks so greener on the other side. It is because there's a septic tank underneath that. It's sewage. 
I've seen so many people do the wrong thing, go the wrong direction. They knew they were transgressing the will of God. They thought that God would put His stamp of approval on it eventually. And those people ended up in depression. They were away from God. Come on, church. I'm telling you today, uh, listen, there's nothing good in this world outside of being in the perfect will and the plan of God. What we need to do is walk in His obedience and we shut the devil out of our lives. But when we disobey, we give him the key. He begins to come in and he begins to wreak havoc all in that house. Listen to me. I, I can go through. I, I could give you marriage counseling today and just stay with the word of God. When the house is out of order, ladies and gentlemen, the devil comes into that place. Whenever it's not a biblical home where that man is the priest of that home, there's a leadership. Those children do not come under the rule and obedience of that mom and dad. You have given the devil a key to that house and there's going to be havoc wreaked constantly. What must we do? We must come back to a obedience in the word of God. No matter how good it looks, tastes or feels, no matter how rich, abundant, wise or successful it will make you. If it is not from God, it will eventually lead you to intense sorrow and end in death. Each and every perfect and good gift is from God. There is no other source. Embrace this truth and settle it in your hearts today. Don't let looks deceive you. It's not as good as it looks. It's not as good as you think. When I was a young teenager, I would sit in church and I would, I would fantasize about that sinful world out there. I, I would think about when I get of age, when I get this age, I'm going to go out in that world. Listen, I may have been in the church, but my mind was in that world. I can tell you today, I went into that world and it was nothing but tears and sorrow and pain and agony. And Listen, I've been here for 23 years. There's so many people who have come through this church, especially a lot of young folks. They've come through the church and they thought that they could taste something out there the devil began to convince them that God wasn't good that God was trying to keep something from them so they went in that world I cannot tell you the testimonies of so many who want to come back to God they say I want to come back home but I just don't feel like I can get free don't you open that door of disobedience because the enemy will come in and he brings havoc in your life how many people today marry the wrong person for the wrong reasons? Disobedience. God may have warned them through parents or a pastor or showed them in their own hearts that they were making the wrong choice, but they wanted to get married so bad. Can I get a witness out there? Anybody? But he's so good looking. Girl, you have no idea what you're about to get into. But she is so beautiful, Brother Matt. I can tell you something. That beauty is going to fade. It's going to fade whenever you see her in the morning time, first of all. Amen. Well, I didn't mean that. But whenever you see what's really there, come on, church. I'm telling you the things that we thought we wanted. You don't really want those things. Listen, I've seen too many say, I wish I'd have listened. I wish I'd have obeyed God, but I gave the devil access to my life. Listen, their own reasoning would drown out the voices because they desired for something that looked good to the natural eye. I'm going to tell you, ain't it? it is not as pretty or as handsome as you think it is. Come on, church. I'm telling you we got to get our ways lined up with God's way I must hear his voice I must obey his voice and there will be peace and tranquility in the end but if you go your own way your own direction there's always going to be pain associated with that please hear me today don't you open that door of disobedience don't open that door don't open that door I'm begging you this morning I try to get away from this message. I want to preach a Thanksgiving message today. I want to preach on gratitude. But the Holy Ghost said somebody's about to open that door. And you get in that church house and you preach. Oh, come on. I want somebody to hear me today. Listen, don't listen to the lies of the adversary. Don't believe his cunning ways and devices. It's a lie. 
Many people disobey the will of God because they are enticed by the good and pleasant. Perhaps it means prosperity or success outside the counsel of God's word. They pursue their own desires and find fun, happiness, and excitement for a season. They find good in what God has said no to. Someone come to the piano this morning. They decide that they want to take the good and the pleasant right now. Think about this. They decide that they want to take the good and the pleasant right now. Moses had that opportunity. But he, he Moses, instead of looking at the good and the pleasant right now, he looked at the future. He looked at the big picture. And Hebrew said that Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's amazing how people will throw away everything. I've seen people throw away everything for a few moments of pleasure. Or what they think is a dream of happiness. It's not true. It's not true. It's a lie. It's a deception. Satan was crafty and cunning enough to convince Eve That God was not good. He completely ignored everything God gave. He made God to be a taker instead of the giver that he is. Listen to me. God has been good to us. God has been good to you. I want you to think back to all the times he's blessed you. And and what he has been in your life. What he has done for you. Times you could have been dead. Listen, there is no fear left of God. I see people constantly either willfully transgressing the will of God. The plan or the word of God. Or so easily coming unto the deception of the adversary. And I'm thinking, man, do you not understand that God holds the key to your life in his hand? He's the one that says that heart can beat 60 beats a minute. He's the one that says you can live there's no fear of God anymore come on church I'm telling you that it will regain our fear of the almighty God we need to regain the fear of God the fear of the Lord Proverbs says is the beginning of wisdom don't open that door of disobedience did somebody call me and tell me something no I believe the Holy Ghost spoke to me this morning I want you to consider the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, though he were a son, the Bible says in Hebrews, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal life to all who obey him. He became, Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, In being made perfect, he became the author of eternal life to all who obey him. You say, well, that's legalism. If that's true, Jesus was the most legalistic person in the Bible. And that's not legalism. Obedience is key in this walk with God. Consider the example of Christ. Forty days and forty nights he fasted. Then the tempter came and Jesus was at the point of starvation. And the tempter came to Jesus and he was hungry after forty days and forty nights of no food. The tempter said, if thou really be the son of God, command these stones that they may be made bread. And Jesus' response was, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God let me tell you what Satan was attempting to do whenever he came to Jesus tempting him in his very weak frail state of mind and body he was attempting to distort the character of his father let me say to you what Satan was saying to Christ in another way he was basically saying Why has the Father led you out here to starve? Why doesn't He provide for you? Perhaps it's time you begin to provide for yourself. 
That's how the enemy operates. Why did the Father, if He really loves you, why did He lead you out here? Why are you in this position? That's what He'll say to us. Why are you here? God led you to this place. God did this to you. Why don't you move out of that place of waiting and do something yourself? Why don't you do what you feel like you need to do? That's exactly what he was saying to the Christ man. Jesus didn't listen to him. He chose to wait on God. He chose to combat the lies of the enemy with the truth of God's word. Jesus denied himself and he waited on God's provision. Satan was attempting to distort the goodness of God, questioning the character of God. That's what he'll do to us. When you go through a trial and a tribulation, whenever hell comes against you, the old enemy, the enemy of our soul will say, why did he allow this to happen to you? God really love you? Is God really good? I'm here to say, God is good. God is good. Jesus gave us the pattern. He would not allow the enemy to pervert the character of God in his mind. He knew his father would provide for his needs. What did he do? He just stood on the word. He was the word, but he stood on that truth. He resisted Satan's temptation to take matters into his own hands. Then the devil left him. And the Bible says, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Hear me. Satan had no access or entrance into the life of Christ because of total obedience. Can we stand? Don't open that door of disobedience. Don't open that door. Satan tried to find access into the Messiah's life because if Jesus would have sinned, he could not become our perpetuation. He could not... He would not have become the sinless, spotless lamb that takes away the sins of the world. But there was no avenue. There was no entrance. There was no door with Christ. And and, and listen to what it says in John 14 and 30. Hereafter, these are the words of Christ, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So verse 30 says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world cometh, that Satan, and hath nothing in me. Let, me. let me just tell you what that means. There's no entrance into my life. He doesn't have any access to me because I keep my Father's commandments. It's powerful when you keep God's word. I've, I've told, I've, I've, I've counseled people in marriage and I've, I've told the wife, are you, I don't care what he's done, let me talk to you, ma'am. Are you coming under the biblical guidelines of a wife and a mother? Well, you just don't understand. I, I said, no, ma'am. That's not what I ask you. Because whenever you're not keeping God's word, you're giving Satan access to your home. Then I look at the man, sir, are you loving her as Christ loved the church? Are you fulfilling all your role? Well, well, brother Matt, I want to. It's hard. You don't understand what it's like. Maybe I don't. But he does. He does. And it's your job, sir, to keep the commandments of God because you've given the devil access to your home, and that's why he's in that house. That's why he's in that house. Mom and dad, you may be single today. You may be a single young person. He gives, you give Satan legal rights into your life by disobedience. You say, devil, here I am. Have your way with me. You wonder why there's depression. You wonder why there's constant defeat in your life because you've given him a key. He has a copy. You've made a lot of copies and you've just given them out freely. Two important universal principles we must never forget. Number one, here it is, in simplicity. Obedience keeps the devil's door shut, denying him legal access. Number two, 
Disobedience throws the door wide open, giving him legal access. These principles are easy to agree with, but quite difficult to live out, especially in today's culture of lawlessness. Are you with me today? Keep the Word of God. If everybody else disobeys the Word of God, keep the Word of God. If you read in the Scripture, you'll find the principles of purity equaling power. I say this often. Purity in the private place equals power in the public place. Purity in the private place equals power in the public place. If David had not killed his lion and his bear, that's that private place battle. You see, it was just him and those little lambs and that lion and the bear. Nobody else beheld that battle. Just him. Those animals, God and the devil. He defeated his line and the bear in the private place. And then whenever he play, play, uh, faced his giant in the public place, he was going to get victory. But it all comes back to obedience and disobedience. Are you keeping God's word? Has God spoke to you by his spirit to do something and you haven't obeyed him? Has God spoken something clearly in his word and you haven't obeyed him? Well, I have a right to be happy. No, you have a right for hell. I have a right to be in hell today. No, I have a right to be happy. No, you don't. The Lord didn't say the happiness of the Lord is your strength. I like to be happy, but you're not promised happiness. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen, happiness depends on circumstances. But joy is contingent on who you know. You can have joy in the midst of the hardest, most difficult trials in your life today. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I dare you to just repent of any form of disobedience this morning and see if God does not begin to protect you. See if He does not cut off access. Change the keys to your home and the access to your life by repenting of any form of disobedience and beginning to obey God. Can we come? I want us to stand around these altars. Come in close. Everyone who physically can today. You may be on the point of doing something that you know is prohibited from God. Don't do it. Don't open that door of disobedience. Let's, let's move in as close as we can. Don't open that door of disobedience. Don't open the door. Years ago, when we lived over on Valley Drive here in Flint, my wife is such a trusting little lady. She'll look at somebody. This is just, it's comical. She's changed. But she'll look at somebody who looks really nice. She automatically trusts them. I, I must get this from my mama. But someone said, someone said, aren't you interested if there's any child predators in your neighborhood? I said, everybody's a potential child predator to me. I got my crosshairs on everybody. It's terrible, isn't it? But my wife is such a trusting little lady. And I would be at work and somebody would knock on the door. And she would, this is when she was younger. She don't do that. It's been at least a decade since she's done this. She'd come and just crack the door like this much and say can I help you I got home one day and I found out that she opened that door I said honey don't ever open that door don't ever open that door I said I want to pretend like I'm a nice salesman don't I look like a nice salesman I smile real big and I walked outside and I and I stood about three or four feet away from the door and I said yes ma'am I've got I, I think I, I think I was a vacuum cleaner salesman I, I think that's what I was 
But I stood three or four feet from that door and I said, Yes, ma'am, can I talk to you just for a minute? And she went. She cracked that door open. And right when she she undid that deadbolt, she cracked that door. I pushed that door open. I shut that door and I looked at her. I said, I got you now. And she went, wow. <laughs> kind of an intense guy, you know what I mean? I'm trying to get my point across. That's what happens. When you open that door, you justify not doing what God told you to do in any area of your life. We we, we can find reasons why we do or we don't do what we are supposed to do. We can find a thousand reasons why. Not one reason is justified in the eyes of God. Not one reason. Don't open that door. Don't open that door. Whatever you're being tempted in to do, or a direction to go, something you know is not right, don't open that door. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I preach what you gave me to preach today. Lord, you knew who was going to be here. You know every thought and every intent of every heart. Lord, I'm asking you to search us today. Lord, it was Paul that said he feared that what the devil did to Eve in the garden He would do to God's people through deception. Lord, help us not to be deceived. Help us not to be deceived. Lord, I cry out to you. Lord, if there's any disobedience in my heart, I want you to cry out to the Lord right now. If you've disobeyed God, if God's told you to do something, if you have been walking in truth, repent right now. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to cleanse me. I'm asking you to forgive me for opening that door. I've made my family open to the attack of the enemy. I've opened up my own life to the attack of the enemy. Help me, Holy Ghost. Come on, church, let's cry out to the Lord. Sing, sister. Cry out to the Lord where you're at today. Ask Him to help you, forgive you. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, oh God, forgive us, Lord. We've justified it. We've made excuses for it when there is no excuse. We've opened up our own family to danger because we've disobeyed God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. Speak to us by your Spirit. Lord, I'm asking you for a divine revelation. Speak specifically to us, Holy Ghost. Speak specifically to us. Any and every little thing that could be considered disobedience to God's Word. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive us. Sharpen us, Holy Ghost. Sharpen us, Holy Ghost. God, help us to deny Satan's access from this point forward. We are going to deny the access of the enemy in our life and in the life of our family. In the name of the Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. I want to remind you of something, church. I want to remind you very quickly. You remember whenever the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho seven times, they blew the ram's horn, and the walls came tumbling down. What a mighty miracle that was. It was a very large city, a great battle. The next battle, if you'll remember, was a little town called Ai. There were specific instructions from the Lord that they were not to take anything out of that city. Nothing. Kill everything, in everybody, all the animals, everything in that city. Don't take any of the possessions. Very strict instructions. But there was a man by the name of Achan. Achan... Along with, or, or no, this was in Jericho. 
Ai was the next city, but he walked into the city of Jericho. The, the strict instruction was don't take any possessions in Jericho. Well, he marched right into one of those rooms with a sword. He killed one of the inhabitants in one of those rooms, and he took gold and a Babylonian garment. He hid it. The Bible says he went back to his tent. He hid it underneath the tent. It was a possession. It was one of the, it was a little bit of loot from Jericho when God told him not to take it. The next city that they fought was Ai. Ai was a very small city. They could have easily defeated them. But they got defeated by Ai. And Joshua knew that sin was in the camp. Joshua knew that somebody had disobeyed God. Well, one thing led to another and he found out who it was. Not only was Achan killed, but everybody in his family. Thank God that we're not in the Old Testament anymore. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad for the, the New Testament, the, the grace and the mercy of God? But the principle remains the same. The principle remains the same. Whenever you willfully transgress God's word, you open up the family. You open up the family to demonic forces, the powers of hell, and they could lose their life spiritually. Yes, yes, absolutely. Somebody can fall out with God because of your decisions. 100% true. I've seen it many, many times. No man lives or dies unto himself. You're responsible for somebody. Brother Duke Down said something to me a long time ago. He was referring to somebody who had really stirred up things. There's a time to expose that. But this missionary is connected with several churches. And he says, I won't say anything for the sake of the body of Christ. He's trying to protect the body. Because no man lives or dies unto himself. You are responsible for your family. You are responsible for your neighbor. You are your brother and sister's keeper. One more time, lift your hands to heaven. Father, drive this word deep within our hearts as we cry out to you in these altars today. Holy Ghost, when the enemy comes to convince us that God is not good, when the enemy comes to convince us, he wants to point out the things we can't have, we can't do, but he wants to ignore all the goodness of God. I pray that we would come back on the devil. We'd reveal to him what God has done for us. Lord, we're going to wait upon the Lord. We're not going to get ahead of God. Lord Jesus, help us. Drive this word deep within our hearts this morning. Drive it deep within our hearts today. Somebody was going to open that door of disobedience. Oh, God, I pray you'd convict them. I pray you'd help them today. Lord, help them to see the danger that lies ahead. Help them to see the danger that lies ahead, Lord. Convict them in the name of Jesus. I want you to reach over and pray for somebody beside you. Heavenly Father, for my brother, for my sister this morning, you know the very thoughts and intents of their heart. You know the temptation that the tempter has brought their way. Oh God, I cry out to you asking you for power, for strength, for the anointing. Lord, enforce the decision when it's a decision in righteousness. Enforce that decision when it's a decision in righteousness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God. Lord, I cry out to you today. Enforce that decision in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing it together. All the blood. All the blood. Hallelujah.
more time, sing it. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. say this, I'm going to close the service, but I say this with a broken heart, not, I told you so, but with a broken heart, I see so many people making decisions, and I'll, I'll, I'll run over to them and say, please don't do this, don't do this, this is against the word of God, please don't do this, please don't do this, one of the most hard, the, breaking things to me is when people call me a year later, six months later, two years later, I just had somebody call me or message me two days ago and said I knew I should have listened and I did. I disobeyed God and I'm paying the price right now. I disobey God. My heart breaks. Don't stick your heels in the ground and go through with something you know you're not to go through with. If it deviates from this Bible, you're going to pay the price. I promise you, you will pay the price. If it deviates from the truth of God's Word, don't do it. Don't open that door. Father, I thank you for your people today. I've delivered what you've given me to deliver. I preach as well as I could. What you have spoken to my heart. I know and believe that you have spoken to hearts and lives today. I pray for the convicting work of the Holy Ghost to move across this sanctuary. Let it be driven deep within our hearts today. Let it change us and transform us. Anyone who was going to go the wrong direction, anyone who was thinking about opening that door, anybody who has opened that door, Lord, this morning they have a right to close that door and change the keys through obedience Lord I'm asking you to help them to do it today this morning I ask you to bless the food let it be nourishment to our bodies bless the time together in Jesus mighty name amen and amen we want everyone to be with us while we eat in the back if you'll make your way over to our gymnasium we got enough food for everybody in this house don't leave ushers Stand at the door. Don't let anybody leave. Just kidding.